Alrighty, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining again. This is class number five of the Organi Organizing the Green New Deal free course. Uh, today, we are very lucky to be joined by Lillian Albernaz, who's a tribal attorney at Fort Belknap Indian Community. I'm going to let her give a little bit more of an introduction and bio here in a sec, but I'm going to pass it over to her and, and we'll just go from there. Thank you for being with us, Lillian. Yeah, thanks for having me. That is one of the best introductions I've had thus far. Um, okay, I'm gonna try to share my presentation. Yahoo, I think, right? Can you all see that? Just my presentation, okay, great. Okay, wonderful. Well, hamitakya pi ishkan wachiakapi. Washichuya Lilian Alvernaz e Makiapie da Makota. Oyate mi tawaki, sisituan, gawakbet tuan, ga hohe, ga Irish, iwichakiapi. But they had not yet oyanke ed omawapi, kia. But they had not yet oyanke ed omawapi. Browning o tue ed matumpie. IHS oyaza kanti pi ed matumpi. Harlem Otuwe Ed Watiye Wakchincha Wakba Hetchia to Hamahi Wana Wanit to Wikchamanum Sama Shahiroha Himacha Fort Belknap Indian Community Ed Dewani Chief Prosecutor Ed Himacha. Hello, my relatives. My name is Elian Alvernez. I am, uh, it's really good to be here with you and to see all of you. I'm really, really grateful that I was asked to be a part of this wonderful uh, initiative and idea. Uh, really, really grateful to uh, have been included in this presentation. Often, you know, I'm fighting to get Indian law or tribal law and policy uh, noticed or as part of the conversation. Uh, I know that oftentimes it's, uh, forgotten about, or it's kind of a late addition, but I've been really uh, appreciative to um, Nick and the Breach Collective team for including it early on and, and the um, ability to be with you this evening or this afternoon, wherever, wherever you are. I'm coming to you from uh, Northeastern Montana in, on the small reservation of the Fort Belknap Indian community. I received a bachelor's in social work and Native American studies from the University of Montana. I received a, uh, I went on to work a couple of years and then I received a Juris Doctor, a Master of Public Administration and an Indian Law Certificate also from the University of Montana School of Law. My focus thus far has been primarily Indian law and tribal law and the marriage of law and policy and the gaps that the law and policy leave in Indian country because, uh, as you may or may not know, there is a um, a special status of Indian country within uh, federal law and then within the United States in general, um, both politically and racially for American Indians or Indigenous people. Also, um, my my passion has been kind of criminal jurisdiction. I won't discuss that this evening, but if you are interested in learning more about it, I'm more than happy to discuss that with you. Uh, previously, I was at the ACLU of Montana doing civil litigation. I worked on things such as uh, First Amendment rights of water protectors in the Keystone XL uh, pipeline, uh, potential pipeline at the time. And we looked at what state and federal agencies were doing in preparation of the Keystone XL pipeline protests and really defining this term uh, confidential criminal justice information and whether that included potential activities or if it uh, did not. And of course, the government entities were trying to say that um, potential protest activities were protected as criminal justice information, which we argued there had to be an ongoing criminal investigation so that they were insinuating that there was a criminal investigation ongoing in potential protest activity. So that was fascinating. And if you're interested in learning more, uh, feel free to head to the ACLU of Montana's website and look at that litigation. 
I also worked at, uh, on things such as voting rights and Indian education, again, in the civil realm. It's a great opportunity and I, I really applaud the, the work that they're doing. Now I am uh, a criminal prosecutor in Fort Belknap on the Fort Belknap Indian community. And it's a lot different than what I was doing obviously, but I'm really grateful to be uh, where my family is from and where um, my people are from being able to uh, continue to spend time culturally and ceremonially on the homelands of my ancestors and um, with the language and the people that, that I come from. This evening, I will uh, first lay a foundation of what I will be discussing and kind of some terminology and, and um, uh, terms of art that I will be using. I will then dive into tribal law and policy, then Indian law and policy. Then I will focus, uh, I'll kind of zoom out and focus more on tribal policy and environmental justice, then Indian policy and environmental justice. I will then touch on international relationships between tribes and, uh, or with, with tribes. And then finally, I will introduce some groups that I think are great um, entities or organizations to support and follow for more information in this field. Um, however, before I get started or, or while I'm starting, I just want to uh, let you all know that I want this to be an open dialogue. I'm not too worried about waiting until the end to ask or answer any questions. I know that this conversation might be a little different than the ones you've been having just because I want to spend so much time on laying the foundation of, of what we're discussing and, um, and selfishly take the opportunity just in case this is your first uh, touch on Indian law or tribal law and uh, make sure that we've got those uh, basic, uh, a basic understanding of those things. So I'm going to go ahead and begin with that. Um, a quick point of order. Um, Nick, will you be running the questions so I don't have to worry about them? Uh, my colleague Danny will be checking on those. And okay, all right. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay, so some uh, good good things to think about within tribal law and Indian law and in this field is use of terminology. Again, I'm only one individual and I only represent me and my upbringing and my uh, lens that I look the, through the world. But in my opinion and in my upraising and understanding, I use the, it, it's always, I think it's safe to say that it's always best to refer to an individual if they are of tribal lineage of their tribe in particular, right? So I identify as Dakota and Nakota. That's specifically who I am, right? Assiniboine and Sioux, Dakota, Nakota, that's me. And it feels kind of pan-Indian or generic to say Indian, Native American, those kinds of things. However, if you're not sure of someone's a tribal, tribal affiliation or you just wanna play it safe, um, the term that's kind of been like in right now or, or, or trendy that I've noticed has been indigenous. Uh, indigenous is safe to refer to the uh, uh, individuals of indigenous descent in the United States as well as internationally indigenous people can cover um, indigenous people from other areas like the Maori in New Zealand, for example. Um, Indian is a term of art that I may use just because in federal Indian law, Indian is a term defined by the federal government. And so I may be using that term. However, keep in mind that that is offensive to some natives and they would prefer to be called indigenous or Native American. So just, just keep that in mind. Um, finally, when I do say Indian or indigenous, I am referring to the American Indian or Native American people in the United States and I am including Alaska Native people in that umbrella. However, just as a quick side note, Alaska Native people do have different rights and um, a different relationship than do uh, other Native Americans in, in the United States. And uh, none of these terms cover uh, Native Hawaiians who are a completely different uh, group and don't enjoy the same uh, relationship with the federal government as um, American Indians, Native Americans, Indigenous people of the United States. So the next 
The next foundational item that I think is important to uh, establish with you all is that there is a difference between tribal law and Indian law, okay? So tribal law is specific to each tribe. Each tribe has their own sets of uh, codes, of policies, and of the way they do things, right? Okay, so if a native, um, for example, commits a crime on a reservation, that's all tribal law, right? Tribal law governs there. Indian law, on the other hand, looks at the relationship between tribes and the federal government, and that's federal Indian law. So some of the cases that go to the United States Supreme Court impact federal Indian law and therefore impact all of the tribes in the United States that are federally recognized, okay? So there's kind of a bunch of different tribes in their tribal law, and then there's this big, big umbrella of federal Indian law that impacts all tribes, even though all of the tribes are very, very different culturally and, and legally. Okay, so again, it's important to remember that the law only sees a tiny, tiny bit. A common theme in, in tonight's discussion that you'll see is that it's really hard to fit a uh, tribal or indigenous understanding within a uh, the non-Indian justice system or the non-Indian system of law, which is um, just one thing we have to acknowledge when when doing uh, when working in the legal field. To be to be frank, uh, in the United States there are over 570 federally recognized tribes. And when I say federally recognized, that means these tribes <clears throat> who the federal government deems as native or as tribes have to go through certain uh, hoops to be considered native in the eyes of the federal government. And uh, to be federally recognized, you either uh, go through an act of Congress, a decision of a United States court, or through what's called the Part 83 process. In Montana, we've had this tribe called the Little Shell Tribe, and they were recognized by the state of Montana as a state recognized tribe for a long, long time, like decades, like 60 years before they were recognized federally in the eyes of the federal government as a federal, federally recognized tribe. They were trying to go through the Part 83 process for a long time, which means um, to be deemed a tribe under that process, the tribe has to be identified as an American Indian entity on a continual basis since the 1900s. A predominant number of the uh, natives of that tribe constitutes a distinct community. So they have to be uh, considered separate, their own entity than other communities from historic times to the present. The nation has maintained a political influence or authority over its members. It must have a copy of the group's governing document, whether that be a constitution or any other court sort of uh, recognizing document. They have to consist of individuals who are not members of other tribes or nations. So I cannot be federally recognized in more than one group in the eyes of the federal government, even though I am many different tribes, the federal government can only look at an individual as one tribe. And the last two points, the last two requirements are, they have to be composed of uh, people who are not, uh, who, who are not members of other tribes and, and the group is not a member or is not a group of different tribes. And then finally, the uh, group needs a land base. And like I was saying, the, the Little Shell have been battling that, uh, that for a very, very long time until they were finally federally recognized in 2020 which was a huge win for the, um, the other tribes in Montana who have always treated them as a federally recognized tribe. But again, it was just state recognized. There are over 334 reservations in the United States. In Montana, we have seven reservations and potentially eight if the Little Shell are able to uh, get a reservation. And of course, there's different, there are several other uh, land holdings and, and allotments and, and different uh, statuses of land within any state um, that does not constitute a reservation but may constitute Indian land. 
And then finally, there are various tribal courts, tribal codes, and tribal policies all within uh, the United States and in uh, different states here in Montana. We are unique that on the seven reservation, each, seven reservations, each tribe has their own tribal court, their own tribal code. And just as a fun side note, I think we're the only state where every tribe has our own tribal college, which is uh, a really uh, a beautiful act of sovereignty. So this is all tribal law, right? So this is all individual tribes, okay? Indian law, the, the federal relationship uh, deemed Indians as a political status, not just a racial status, right? So I know that this isn't the topic, but, but the example that comes to mind instantly is um, the Indian Child Welfare Act, which is being challenged because if Indians are a racial group, then yes, we would be treated differently and the Equal Protection Clause would say we, can't, we cannot have something like the Indian Child Welfare Act. But since Indians are a unique group with a political affiliation with the United States government, things like the Equal Protection Clause fail and Indian Child Welfare Act win. Okay, so this, this um, the eras I'm going to go through shortly will demonstrate to you why Indians are a political status and not a racial status with the United States, okay? And eras in federal Indian law are defined by these federal policies and attitudes of the time, as well as uh, the SCOTUS, the Supreme Court of the United States. And there's some quote I can't recall exactly, but it's about how there's not another more heavily regulated group of people as Indians or Native Americans in the United States. Uh, so the first group that really, of course, it's always good to remember that, you know, natives were here long before contact and we had our own justice systems and our own ways of doing things, our own cultures, etc. cetera, uh, long before contact. So our history did not begin with contact, but uh, it's always good to acknowledge that because time periods like this generally start with, with contact. I'm beginning with uh, the colonial period, which is when something like the doctrine of discovery was deemed appropriate in the eyes of the SCOTUS. Uh, if you all don't mind, I'll just say SCOTUS instead of uh, Supreme Court of the United States. They deemed uh, the doctrine of discovery appropriate so that Indian land could be discovered because, um, because they said so, basically. This is when the government signed treaties with the tribal entities. And this is really where we see the beginning of the government to government relationship because by signing treaties with tribes, they deemed tribes as government. And that's where I think the birth of the government to government relationship really started. The next time period included removal, uh, creation of reservations and more of the treaty period. This is when the United States population and military strength continued to grow and so did pressure on tribes to give up lands. So the United States sought to obtain more land uh, through aggressive military campaigns, as well as relocation of tribes. And so this is where we saw really the creation of reservations and moving natives from one place in the United States to a different place. And they said, this is going to be where you live now. This is going to be a reservation. The next time period has been deemed uh, by some as the most detrimental time period to natives uh, ever. The General Allotment Act in 1887 was hugely, hugely devastating to Indian people, and we're still seeing the impacts of those today. So the General Allotment Act or the Dawes Act segregated uh, what was left of Indian land into these parcels. And they awarded, I think it was like 80 acres to each head of household. And that's where, where that family was supposed to live. But every generation that the allotment was passed down, it has been fractionated and refractionated and refractionated. So on some reservations, 
there are like 30 heirs to one plot of land. And that is a mess if you know anything about property law to be able to sell it or gift it or anything. And so it's just, it's been hugely devastating to tribes. Also because what was left of the, uh, what was given in allotments, all of that extra land was just given to settlers. And so it was something like over 90 million acres or two thirds of what was deemed reservation land at the time was taken from tribes and given to settlers. So it was likely the hugest amount of land that we lost at that time. Um, again, settlers wanted more land within reservations at this time, even though the reservations were already assigned. The next time period, I think, is where the government really began noticing the devastating impacts of the federal policies thus far. They passed uh, the Indian Reorganization Act, which is also known as the Wheeler Howard Act in 1934, which formally ended allotments, ended the uh, Ended, ended the gifting of, of native lands in, in that aspect. And it also gave tribes the opportunity to adopt boilerplate constitutions. And this is where the federal government attempted to begin to restore tribal lands and, to tribal nations, attempted to reform their tribal governments, and attempted to create programs and projects to help rehabilitate the reservation economies that had been devastated by prior federal Indian policy that, that's listed above. However, the, the attitude of the federal government swung back uh, to termination. There's this quote, I think it's by Ruth Bader Ginsburg, where it's deemed federal Indian law is, is just a pendulum that swings back and forth because you'll see where it's like detrimental to tribes and then supportive to tribes. But now we're back on detrimental to tribes during the termination period where the federal government literally terminated tribes and in its eyes it said we're going to not we're going to no longer look at you as a federally recognized tribe and and you're no you're you're not a tribe anymore of course you are uh, culturally and you know your your own language and practices of course of course but in the eyes of the federal government they no longer were looking at you as a tribe this is where PL280 public law 280 was passed which was another blow to tribes this awarded tribes, uh, this awarded the state jurisdiction instead of the federal government within reservations. And a tribe in Montana that is affected by that is the Confederate Salish and Kootenai. And finally, during this time period, there was a formal relocation of tribes of native people from reservations to urban areas. So they literally bust groups of natives from rural reservations to places like LA or Denver all over the United States so that they would gain employment and, and disperse all over the United States. So there are tribal members from this tiny small reservation in Northeastern Montana all over the United States, which is detrimental to native identity and tribal sovereignty in general. So next is by some, the the time period that we're in now but by others it's 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 uh not quite yet where we're at this is the self-determination period it started in the 1960s which is where we saw uh, acts of of resistance of groups like the american indian movement really trying to hold the government accountable and saying you, you need to believe and honor tribal sovereignty this is a resurgence of tribal government and federal policy where tribes really are taking back control and management of our resources, of our lands, and of our programs. When so, so some some entities and individuals believe we're still in, in the self determination period now. This is where the, the government tried to provide tribes with tools to really uh, run our own run our own entities, groups, lands, etc instead of having the, the federal government run, run it for us. Some groups believe that we're in the nation to nation period, which is kind of an advancement of the self-determination period. It strengthens the government to government relationship between tribes and the federal government. And it really, really zones in on tribes using federal policy to strengthen their independence from the federal government. Something important to note during this time period, the Supreme Court 
ruled pretty much in line with with these with these policy eras. But what was developed is the Indian canons of this construction. If you know, if you have ever worked in federal Indian law, you've likely heard this. This is where the Supreme Court has made these three canons that we must honor in interpreting uh, uh, tribal either treaties or any sort of Indian law case we have. So that says treaties, agreements, and statutes, executive orders are to be one, liberally construed in the favor of Indians, and all ambiguities are to be resolved in their favor. Secondly, treaties and agreements are to be construed as the Indians would have understood them at the time. And finally, tribal property rights and sovereignty are preserved unless Congress has an explicit intent to the contrary and it is clear and unambiguous. I didn't touch on this, but I guess now that I'm saying that I really should, Congress has plenary power over Indian affairs. And this is because of a couple of Supreme Court decisions and the constitution. Uh, it's, it's one of two mentions of, of tribes and Native Americans. But Congress, if, if they can only abrogate a treaty right, if they explicitly say so. So it's not, you can't infer it. You can't uh, guess, guess it. It needs to be explicit. So that's why Congress has plenary power over Indian affairs. Okay. So a large theme of tribal policy and environmental justice is the difficulty of fitting indigenous lifeways and knowledge into the non-Indian system of law or justice. Vine Deloria Jr. said, the law is the colonizer's storytelling tradition. It's important to remember that tribes and Indian people still practice traditional forms of sustenance. This was recognized by the Supreme Court recently in Herrera v. Wyoming, where a Crow tribal member followed a group of elk off of the Crow Reservation into the Bighorn National Forest in Wyoming, where he did have a treaty protected right to hunt. That said, Crow, the Crow tribal members have a right to hunt on unoccupied lands. And so what was at the Supreme Court was whether the Bighorn National Forest was unoccupied or not. And so using the Indian canons of construction, it was likely that the Indians at the time of signing that treaty believed unoccupied to mean literally, I didn't see a settler there. And the Bighorn National Forest, as you uh, know, is, is unoccupied where there's not people actually settling there. And so uh, Clavin Herrera, the plaintiff in that case actually won and, and uh, he, he got to practice and honor his a traditional form of uh, hunting by pointing to his treaty. Something important I like to always let indigenous people know or um, tribes just try to empower tribes to do is that treaties are active documents, even though they were signed so long ago, they're so, so phenomenally important to Indian law and Indian way of life to where I really encourage my fellow tribal members to look at their treaties and to become familiar with their treaties so that they can point back to where something like this hunting right is, is listed. They're, they're not, even though in other forms of, of the law, maybe uh, it would be too old of a document because of the way that Indian law works is that we're always pointing back to those old treaties and honestly to these three foundational cases at the Supreme Court to really establish any sort of uh, case or, or law that, that we're interpreting. So the use of uh, another important thing to, to recall is that the use of environmental law as a primary legal mechanism to challenge the construction of a pipeline or another environmental challenge distorts the indigenous demand for justice as US federal Indian law, or excuse me, US federal law is incapable of seeing the full depth of indigenous worldview. So indigenous activists are constantly forced to recenter 
their direct actions and protests within Indigenous culture to remind non-Indigenous activists and the wider media or the public that protests were an Indigenous, are an Indigenous act, an Indigenous protest, rather than a purely environmental protest or environmental cause. So it's important to keep in mind that even though uh, places like No Dapple, right, the Dakota Access Pipeline protest there, even though it appeared indigenous worldview and indigenous weight or, or what they sought there was aligned with environmental interests, it's, it's different and it's separate and, and it sometimes gets lost in the media or in the public when they see the interests being aligned. However, I would encourage all of you in the work that you're doing to not forget the indigenous or the tribal tie to the land and to the cause rather than letting it get distorted and moving into a purely environmental issue as opposed to uh, the, the true connection that tribes or indigenous people have with the land or with the cause. Uh, Lillian, would you like to, to take a question or two at this point? Sure, let's do it. Great. Um, well, Nick has a question, which if, if his internet connection is okay, I might let him expand on, which is he's asked if there's any risk in asserting treaty rights. Um, and then uh, Kate Unger has asked Lillian for your uh, thoughts and perspective on the uh, McGirt decision in relationship to to uh, Green New Deal goals. Okay, thank you. Sure. So yes, there is a risk in asserting treaty rights uh, because any time that you are asserting a right, you have the opportunity to get it cut down and to get it further defined. So so there's there's pros and cons to that, right? So by Clavin asserting his treaty right, it was almost, he didn't expand it, but he exercised his treaty right to, to be able to hunt on an unoccupied land. However, the Supreme Court could have went the direct opposite way and said, you don't have the right to hunt on the Bighorn National Forest and the Bighorn National Forest is unoccupied or is not unoccupied. So yes, there's a risk in asserting treaty rights. However, Oddly, the Supreme Court lately has been quite favorable to uh, treaty rights. And even though someone like Neil Gorsuch was terrifying to, uh, for, on, on the, the surface, it looked, it looked very scary. But if you dive into his jurisprudence being from Colorado, he actually is quite favorable to tribes and and has been an ally on uh, Indian cases thus far. And my thoughts on McGirt, I thought that was a phenomenal, phenomenal decision. Um, I cried when, when the decision came out. Um, for those of you that are unfamiliar, I've been out of the civil game for a little bit, so it'll just take me a minute to recall, but this is where an individual uh, was I think being looked at for murder and it was whether the land that he murdered on was state or was still tribal. And there's where a perfect example of Congress never explicitly uh, demolished the reservation. And because of that, the land was still deemed Indian land. And I, um, I, I guess it's, you know, a huge win for tribes a huge win for interpretation of uh, really holding Congress accountable and really not getting sloppy with how you abrogate treaty rights or um, diminish reservations with, without explicit language. And I'm, I, am, I am really, really grateful, grateful for the McGirt decision. And I guess in relationship to Green New Deal goals, it should be, uh, it should be, aligned with it, especially because, you know, I'm sitting here this evening and obviously Breach Collective has an interest in uh, Indigenous justice and in um, tribal sovereignty. And so I would believe that we should, we would all uh, want to support, support tribal sovereignty and, and the Indigenous uh, worldview and lens of such. And thank you for, for sending the SCOTUS blog um, for McGirt. 
Okay. So uh, move, getting back to, to this, there, there is a movement right now. I don't know if you're all on Twitter or wherever, but about land back really um, this might be where environmental and indigenous uh, justice rub because the movement of land back is like not only physically giving land back to tribes, but everything within that where it's like land back, language back um, to really combat the loss of cultural and ecological diversity when, uh, when trying to fit in between in non-Indian forms of justice and, and really continuing the status quo uh, by, by, by acknowledging the indigenous right to environmental self-determination would which would allow indigenous people to maintain their cultural and political status upon their indigenous, or excuse me, their traditional lands is, is essential. Uh, I would encourage you all to read The Indigenous People and Environmental Justice, The Impact of Climate Change by Re Rebecca Tsosi. And she really dives into that, into that rub of where it's not just the interest of justice that makes it imperative that indigenous cultures be protected from environmental harm, but the intergenerational quality of indigenous identity that is closely linked to traditional lands and resources, kind of like I was discussing earlier of, of it's a little different than um, purely just, just the environmental um, I guess the environmental uh, potential harm harm there. Um, another an additional reason is that indigenous peoples and the land that the lands that sustain us are closely linked through ancient epistemologies that organize the universe differently than the Western non-Indian epistemology. And the difference between the language of the tribes over the course of things like the um, Dakota Access Pipeline litigation and the language of the indig indigenous activists at the protest camps really demonstrates how the law requires a claim to be addressed and, and fitting into the non-Indian box of litigation to be a recognizable claim. And using environmental law as the primary vehicle to file a complaint, the linguistic and representational bind of law distorted distorts indigenous demands for justice and obscures its philosophical roots and communities so we can't say things like i have a tie to the land and it's so sacred and beautiful and i it's it's hard to put that on words and it's hard for a court to recognize that it's frankly the law is not only unable to understand indigenous claims but it's actually hostile to our ways of knowing and our understanding of that relationship with the land. Okay, so moving a little bit from tribal policy to Indian policy, within the government to government relationship as established by numerous SCOTUS cases, cases at the United States Supreme Court, a federal trust relationship has been established. So the federal government has a responsibility to protect tribal property, tribal assets, and hold property and assets in trust for the benefit of the tribe. Due to this trust responsibility and the complex history of treaty rights within the United States and tribes, Things like consultation is more about communication, respect, and partnership. Though meaningful comp consultation, through meaningful consultation, a federal agency can respect tribal sovereignty, honor the trust relationship, learn and appreciate tribal values, avoid misguided errors and false presumptions, and make informed decisions about what the best course of action is. When I was thinking about this, this discussion, I, I wanted to, I didn't want to forget to remind you all that if you are able to establish like some sort of an advisory board or really make sure you've got a good relationship with tribes or 
uh, indigenous individuals in your area or, or have, um, have some sort of advisory board or, or liaison, just so you don't lose that and that you are able to acknowledge these things and, and not overlook them or, or forget them in the environmental justice work that you do. So jumping a little bit back to treaty interpretation, it, it's also essential to, to recognize that when, when considering the Indian canons of, of construction, even though as a rule, we're supposed to interpret this language, how the tribe would have seen it at that time, or how I would have understood it at that time. Now that I'm on my own language learning journey, and I'm really deep into actually learning and speaking and understanding my language, though I was raised traditionally going to things like sweat lodges, medicine lodges, and, and I have always um, looked at the world through that lens. Now that I'm learning the, the language, there's so much more. And I feel like my connection to who I am is so much different because along with learning the language is uh, learning a different way to look at the world and learning a different um, lens to look through things. So that's why it's important that we or, or non-Indian court systems really consider shifting the way that we look at how Indians understood treaty language at that time, right? At the time that the treaty of treaty construction or at the time of the signing of the treaty because the, the languages that the tribe spoke was a completely different mindset, worldview and understanding than it is today. And we cannot generate, this was, um, a quote from, from a, a piece, Cultural Linguistics and Treaty Language, we cannot generate tribal intent without living this way of life. So we have no idea how Indians at the time would have understood the treaties without walking the walk and talking the talk. Tribal languages in general offer a different perspective, a different angle on the world we live in. It focuses on processes and relationships rather than cause and effect and other categories as seen in English and European languages. Finally, because of the inability of tribes and indigenous worldview to fit into the non-Indian box of the legal system, of the justice system, litigation isn't always the best solution. Uh, I would encourage you all to Follow this link to this article that discusses um, how indigenous treaties help environmental winds and, and really advance that. However, at the same time, uh, again, thinking about alliance with environmental groups, it creates an, uh, like I said earlier, it creates an expectation by the public and the media that the indigenous interest there is purely environmental and distorts the, the worldview and understanding of really, really how the spiritual connection that again gets lost in the, in the litigation um, aspect when, when you're forced to put things on paper and really define them, it loses a lot of that. Um, I know some cases where we won't even point to where sacred land is because we can't do that. And what do you do with that? How do we protect a sacred site if we're not supposed to put it on paper? And by putting it on paper and, and wanting to protect it, then we out it and then we, we give it away and people, people know where it's at. So there's all of these conflicts that whether it's in indigenous worldview or other minority worldview, it's it's something we have to continue to acknowledge uh, within this within this field. So I wanted to touch on um, international relationships because I believe that I was asked to do that. Uh, the United Nations or such international relationships have proven useful to tribes. This is especially notable due to the political status and government to government relationships between tribes and the federal government. So it's only appropriate that international relationships are 
uh, used as a sovereign outlet, sovereign to sovereign. Uh, a few recent examples and recent and relevant examples include the following. Uh, in regards to the Dakota Access Pipeline, Chairman Archambeau of the Standing Rock Tribe went before the United Nations Human Rights Council to raise awareness about the protests and to repeat the tribe's argument that their sovereign rights had been violated by the Army Corps of Engineers. The uh, international law does acknowledge in Indian canons of construction, the practice of international law and interpreting ambiguity against part of whose language in the agreement is drafted provides a legal basis for the canon as well as providing an explanation of why tribal intent is not considered if the court deems language unambiguous. Again, this is from the cultural linguist, linguistics and treaty language. Finally, in 2007, the United Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples was uh, drafted and the United States joined that in 2010. If you follow this UNDRIP link, it provides a full text of, of the uh, United Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, finally, the Water Protector, Legal, Water Protector Legal Collective, which is a group that was born to protect the individuals who were trying to hold the government accountable when uh, protesting the Dakota Access Pipeline. They formed this legal collective uh, to really help the individuals have counsel so that they wouldn't be held accountable for the inappropriate actions of the federal government. And their attempt to exercise treaty rights and, and land rights when protesting the Dakota Access Pipeline, they wrote this report to the international uh, American Commission on Human Rights, and I would highly recommend that you all uh, take a look at that. It really breaks down the federal government's um, failure in, to protect indigenous rights and tribal rights and really um, kind of calls out the inappropriate relationship between the federal government, and private security entities, and um, really counter to, to tribal interests. Um, I'll just close this slide and then, and then I'll be ready for you, Danny. Um, but in, in all of this, in retelling of traditional stories, it strips out the complex uh, oral histories that traditional healers and traditional elders use to explain sacredness of the land and why it must be protected in certain ways. These retellings flatten nuanced relationships and arguments uh, in litigation and by tribal leadership at places like the United Nations Council. Uh, I would highly recommend the piece under Coyote's Mask, Environmental Law, Indigenous Identity, and Hashtag No Dapple by Danielle Delaney, uh, where really is Danielle dives into that relationship um, internationally and where how the how the litigation really fails indigenous interests. Do we have any more questions? Before we, we do, Lillian, if, if you are able to take a couple. Um, okay. We've got uh, um, one from uh, Elise Peterson Trujillo, um, who asks um, if you can speak to the uh, false assumption that is often made between purely environmental or purely conservationist campaigns um, that are only of interest to white, to be white centrist environmental movement and how this uh, sort of assumption falls apart when confronted uh, with Indigenous relationships to land. Uh, and and uh, she asks if you can also uh, comment on the tension between uh, conservation of land and Indigenous management of land. Oh, this is a good one. I wish I wish I could give you a better answer because I, oh gosh, I, I can't give you as good an answer as I would like to because I think um, this just goes back to by using litigation, I think we fall into that um, that tension, and by you by the advancement through the court system and through environmental law thus far, we've steered more toward conservation and less toward the relationship of indigenous people and land and that management of the land. But hopefully. In one of these pieces that I was quoting, hopefully through our restructuring of the way that we understand 
uh, indigenous or Indian law and environmental law in that intersection, we can reframe that, that thought, that thought process and that understanding to do more of uh, indigenous management or indigenous understanding of relationships to the land. Um, take Just take note of, of the pieces that I reference and um, if you have time, I would highly recommend reviewing those. Yeah, and we'll, we'll do our best to uh, collate all of those and send them out as links after this presentation. Um, and then uh, uh, Jenna Noblock, and, and Jenna, I apologize if I mispronounced your surname, uh, asks uh, that some groups in the conservation community oppose land back uh, and particularly in reference to national forests that were formerly reservation lands and also tribally led uh, federal lands projects and is asking you Lillian what advice you have uh, for the environmental community when considering or approaching these topics? That's a great question and I think um, it's a it's a great subject of tension right because who 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 really understands better who really knows better and who's the most appropriate speaker for the the land back movement and um, you know, saving public lands. I don't know, but I think it's good to have those conversations and, and really challenge these entities to think critically about um, land back and about, uh, you know, not an, an opposition to land back. Um, just keep it on, I would say, just keep it on the forefront of your mind and in include people you disagree with so that you can really be sure um, that you understand each each side of the coin. And then uh, one more, if, if that's okay, um, yeah. from uh, Shri uh, Marotra, um, asking uh, if you can clarify in what cases it is detrimental to identify sacred land sites on paper uh, for use in litigation. Yes. So I didn't I didn't reference any specifically, but yes. Um, off the top of my head, I cannot think of the name, but if I do, I'll be happy to email that to Nick um, and let you all know. And even personally, like, even though there's no litigation, but being being raised, again, traditionally Assiniboine, that's the only way that I know. It's just my tribe and and actually particularly the the one lodge that I go to. I would be devastated if I had to let the general public know where we practice our, our, our ceremonies because it's so sacred and so private, um, even though of course I want that land protected and, and of course I want my relationship to, to the land there protected, but I, I don't know. It's, it's a good example of, of that tension. And Lillian, if it's okay, I'll just comment briefly. Um, yeah, in, please. In, in Australia, there's a um, an, an analogous issue with um, uh, Aboriginal title, which we call native title uh, claims there, which is claims by Indigenous groups for native title rights in, in land. Um, and part of that process involves sort of identifying your cultural connection with the land and, and with um, certain sort of geographic features um and uh the way the courts have sort of got around this because often the uh the dreamings which are sort of the mythologies associated with particular features um certain dreamings or certain parts of dreamings are only available to uh the males in, in the community some are only available to to the women um some are not available to outsiders at all or, or they don't want them to be written down uh and the way that the courts have got around it in australia is they um they'll have uh, hearings on country so the court will actually go and sit uh, you know at, at the particular area um, and, and take evidence that way um, and then also the other tool is to uh, take the evidence uh, under seal so so it's it's it's, yeah. sealed, it's sealed testimony it's sealed evidence I don't know I profess ignorance as to whether there's mm -hmm. uh, similar practices in the US court system but that's one way it's been dealt with in in other countries that have similar settler colonial issues Wonderful, thank you. So along with the articles that I've been referencing, and again, I will email those, but to continue this, uh, your own um, education, understanding, and just if you would like, I cannot say enough good things about each of these entities. 
The Indian Law Resource Center is a great environmental and international resource. They have projects specifically on international issues as well as environmental issues. The Indigenous Environmental Collective was huge with uh, pipeline protests and of course the um, the uh, confirmation of uh, Madam Secretary Deb Holland for, this, for the Department of the Interior. Uh, the Water Protector Legal Collective, which I mentioned earlier, uh, that really grew out of um, protecting water protectors and the um, Dakota Access Pipeline protests. Tribal Court Clearinghouse has so many environmental resources on different tribal groups. It has a huge list of different tribal codes on environmental law for specific to each tribe uh, that they have listed. And if you're able to access this PowerPoint at the conclusion of my presentation, each of these are hyperlinked to their um, page. So this one's hyperlinked to the environmental, um, the environmental justice page. The Native American Rights Fund or NARF has a specific uh, initiative to protect tribal natural resources. Of course, they do a lot more than that, but I've linked it to directly to that initiative. Um, and finally, even the EPA has a specific uh, environmental production in Indian country page. Other good resources in general, less on environmental, but just uh, to get news in Indian country include Indians.com, Indians with a Z, Indian Country Today Media Network. Uh, Turtle Talk is a legal blog and um, they publish every everything uh, on Indian law. They've got this two-part podcast series on um, the uh, indigenous environmental relationship. And then finally, I, I know I referenced Vine Deloria Jr. a couple of times, but he's got great literature on um, on really shifting shifting the mindset of the indigenous person and and our relationship to the land. I would highly recommend um, Vine Deloria Jr. Okay, so in closing, the indigenous languages uh, fluency of our langu languages is important to preserving different ways of knowing and knowledge. I talked about this earlier about how uh, my mindset is shifting and, and learning indigenous languages shifts a mindset and understanding. And I think the scientific community would greatly benefit uh, shaping itself culturally based on these epistemological orientations and bringing knowledge and understanding from indigenous cultures. And culture should not be understood as individual traits, but rather as constellation of ways in which people think, act, make sense of the world, only by acknowledging the deep cultural and ethnic roots of language through the evidence submitted in court cases, interpreting treaties uh, with American Indian tribes, and may the courts of the colonizer begin to reconcile the conflicting worldviews and begin to address the sacred responsibility to the indigenous people and Turtle Island. And finally, just in closing, I will I will say uh, the law does and will continue to struggle to find its place within the traditional legal discourse of indigenous philosophy. And with that, I will say Pidamayayapi, thank you all so much. And I'm happy to continue the conversation or answer any more questions that you will have on this, um, this rich topic. Thank you so much, Lillian. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, yeah, I, I do encourage any uh, anyone in the audience who has a question to put it in the chat or, or use the Q&A function. I'm happy to read out uh, any questions you might have. Um, I think we'll try and go for another sort of five, 10 minutes or so. We'll, we'll see how many questions we have. I, I had a few that I sort of took down um, as I was listening to you, Lillian, so I might just open with one of those um, and yes. see if that sparks any more discussion. Yes, of course. And then I will just add, if if you're all able to access this PowerPoint to, to really dive into those links, and then my email is on the first page if you do have any questions about um, Indian law or tribal law in general. And I do want to just appreciate Kate for linking to the uh, Indigenous Language Institute.
I'll just put that link in so all attendees can see it. There we go. Um, yeah, so I might just start um, and ask you um, in relation to what you were saying about, uh, I guess, the sort of uh, tensions that exist between uh, Indigenous and tribal sovereignty and the sort of conservation of public lands and the role that a lot of Green New Deal advocates see for public lands um, in, uh, in a just transition. Um, you know, in light of some of those tensions you identified, um, how do you think uh, that uh, Deb Holland's um, confirmation as Secretary of the Interior might sort of help move the needle or help sort of move things in a particular direction on that? Or, or do you think that? I think she's at such a difficult position to be in because as uh, a Native woman, it would be really, really hard not to just be selfish and, um, and put tribal interests first. I, and I think she's a really, she's a well-informed individual in the environmental realm as well as the indigenous realm. So I think that it would be um, very, very hard, but I think it's uh, probably best, best, best case scenario um, to have her in there because she is so knowledgeable. And I think that uh, whatever way that she tips the scale, it'll be um, deliberately and, and with the best, uh, with the best interests in mind. Fun side note, just because I was talking about federal Indian policy earlier, until I think it was 1824, or maybe it was 1924, but the Department of the Interior, the, uh, the it, it used to be ran, so tribes used to be housed in the Department of War until we were moved to the Department of the Interior, which I think is kind of funny. Right. Um, I did want to also ask you, it was sort of touched on a bit when we were sort of going through the phases of, of I suppose, US government relationship with, with tribes and, and Indigenous peoples in the country and, and those different phases. Um, something that Nick Estes and I think some others have drawn attention to is that uh, with the, the New Deal, with FDR's New Deal, many of the sort of big energy and infrastructure projects were sort of carried out on the backs of uh, indigenous peoples and to the detriment of indigenous lands and, and cultural and natural resources. And I'm sort of wondering what kind of, what you think are the sort of considerations and priorities that need to be um, kept in mind when we're sort of talking about massive infrastructure build out and public spending as part of a Green New Deal. Thanks. Well, I would just say, don't forget about, don't forget about tribes or, or indigenous rights or indigenous justice. And, and even if it's, um, you know, for the general public, don't forget about the indigenous relationship with the land and, and the rights and the rights there. Keep it in mind if there's any way to create some sort of advisory board or liaison or cultural check. Um, I would highly recommend that just because I, I really hope it's not, it won't be forgotten. I think Lynn, my <laughs> internet might be good enough to jump in and, and ask a question if, if you're okay with that. Um, I um, sat on a, it's like a comic question, but I, I sat on a land trust in my hometown in Klamath Falls, Oregon. And um, it's really interesting because there were, was a lot of land that was going up for sale through the, the, the um, context of a drought. And so land values had, had dropped a lot. And, um, you know, I was spending a lot of time like thinking about how, to work with the climate tribes in order to like to to figure out like coordinated land management type stuff because really hard to get land back on the books through the BIA's process as I understand it because it like takes money it takes money out of the county's coffers and so they'll like vociferously oppose it and it's like a long and onerous procedure to get it back but I wonder if you come across any sort of like hybrid ways of of doing. You know, kind of like land back policy. That's not that's not full like repatriation, but something that kind of like gets values and principles in place and gets us on a way toward toward land back. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't I don't have any professional experience with that, but I know that people are doing. I know that people are doing it, 
any one of those groups listed, I'm sure have a resource on that or have an example of that. And there's individuals within, um, within that, that I would encourage you to like, I'm a big, um, I like Twitter and I know that there's people on there who, uh, are super awesome to follow on Twitter, like Dallas Goldtooth from the Indigenous Environmental Collective. Highly, highly recommend. He's super, super knowledgeable. And I think that um, I'm sure that there's something about that, but unfortunately I haven't had uh, any experience on it. But that's that's the way that we need to be thinking, right? That that is that is the goal to to be able to do those kinds of things. Um, I'll just uh, put to you a question, another question from Sri, uh, which is asking you, Lillian, what advice you have for environmental groups that partner with Indigenous communities and whether there are common issues that arise that um, environmental groups should uh, work to improve on? Okay, so I would say start with building relationships. Building relationships is huge before you go in and you're like, let's do this environmental code or this um, project, be a part of the community. I know it's really hard because we're in a pandemic, but if there's any way that you can really show face and make relationships that are, uh, that are genuine and long lasting, that's a great, great, great way to begin to partner with groups. And then you'll really understand what the community wants. Maybe they want something that um, you know, wasn't apparent, or maybe they do have the same interests as X environmental group. Uh, so I would say not only environmental groups, but everybody should work on improving relationships and, and being genuine when they go to tribal communities. And don't forget, don't just try to meet with the tribal council, although yes, they have the final say in a lot of things. There are so many grassroots organizations and people on the ground that are doing great work that might be uh, counter to what the tribal council's interests are. Great answer. Um, Justine Burt has a question uh, about um, the governor of California setting a goal of um, conserving 30% uh, of land for conservation by 2030 and, and noting a statistic from the World Wildlife Fund that um, the planet has lost 70% of all wildfires since 1970. And uh, asking in that context whether land back is a strategy um, to advocate for setting aside more land for wildlife restoration. And, and I might use that question as an opportunity to, to also tack on one of my own. Um, I think sort of as a climate change adaptation response, there's been a lot of interest in uh, traditional ecological knowledge or, or in, in, you know, in indigenous knowledge systems, um, particularly in the West around sort of the idea of prescribed burning or cultural burning as, as we call it back in Australia. And I'm wondering, what your sort of take is on that and whether you think it's sort of a, a genuine attempt to uplift these knowledge systems or whether it's sort of a sort of last minute, you know, attempt to kind of instrumentalize this as a sort of, you know, desperate strategy to, to deal with climate change. And if it is the latter, you know, what can be done to make it more like the former? So if it is the latter, uh, I, I am, I, I kind of want to giggle because like I'm so naive and I always just think everybody's like trying to be like do the right thing and be positive so I don't know if I'm the best person to ask about that but I would say uh, land back could be a strategy to advocate for setting aside uh, more land for wildlife restoration it definitely could be if, if it's done right and in partnership with tribes and tribal communities for sure. And uh, the second part of the question about the uh, wildfires, yes, I think that is possible. And I also think it's just so ironic that, um, you know, now, uh, like, like you mentioned, yes, let's do prescribed burn, but just like, and sorry to go off here, but just like uh, pharmaceutical companies, it's like just when you uh, validate something by science that indigenous people have been doing for so long, then it becomes um, legitimate, right? So like, even though tribes and tribal people have been using um, burnings or um, X plant for medicinal purposes, it needs to be validated by science until then it becomes uh, appropriate or, or adopted by the larger society. Those are great points. Um, Okay, if there aren't any more questions in the chat, um, I think we might wrap things up there. 
Um, thank you so much, Lillian. Fantastic presentation, fantastic responses to those questions. Really appreciate you joining us. Um, is there any final words you have? Yeah, of course. I just, um, again, want to thank you guys for having me. Uh, I had so much fun. I'm so, so, so grateful for each of you, not only for asking me, but for sitting through this. And um, it means a lot. And I'm really grateful for being mindful and deliberate in the work that you do. And also thank you for the work that you do. I wish you guys the best of luck and um, are you all the best of luck. And I hope that if I can you know, be of any support moving forward, either to connect you with other individuals or entities, please just let me know. But again, thank you all so much. Dokshta, have a good night and enjoy the weather. It might be spring. Thanks so much. Um, we'll make the recording of this, uh, this class available uh, later tonight, um, send out the readings and slides as we can. And uh, next week we've got uh, uh, our speaker is um, Saul Levin, who's the legislative assistant for uh, Congresswoman Corey Bush. Um, so another really exciting speaker um, and his uh, topic is going to be federal climate policy before 2022. So what can be done in the next, I guess, two legislative sessions federally. All right, well, with that, thank you everyone and uh, looking forward to uh, continuing the discussion offline and um, rejoining next week.